All right. Well, welcome to Farms Weekly Wednesday webinar series. This is part two of Foraging for Food with Rachel Brazil. Um, and I'm sure that you remember from last week who she is, but if not, she can feel free to tell you a little bit about what she's doing this week for Thanksgiving and um, then talk some more about foraging. We uh, begin promptly at noon and end before one, so people who are working can go back to work. Everybody will be placed on mute during this session so that the uh, speaker will be uninterrupted. And if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box and we will get to them after the session is over or raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk. So without further ado, uh, oh, I want to mention next week is the last um, co-op, why co-ops are valuable session with Heidi DeMars. It's the last webinar of this series. We'll start again at the end of January with a whole bunch of new ones. And this next semester, they're free. So welcome to Farms Ooh. Weekly Wednesday webinars. Rachel, I'm going to turn the, the um, presentation over to you and you may begin whenever you are ready. Okay, show my screen. Well, hi everyone and good to talk to you again. Thanks for joining me for the second round of Foraging the Wild. Um, Sue wants me to talk about what I'm having for Thanksgiving because we were just talking about that when we got on. So. Um, today is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and our plan, we just have our family, me and my husband, my uh, two sons, and we kind of start with the meat, and then everything else falls into place. So what our meat is going to be this year is venison roast, and we're going to dress it with a blueberry and basil sauce. Um, the blueberries we got whenever we were um, in Oregon visiting Michael's family, and my son pick, and grandpa picked them at... Um, a you pick farm and we came back with 75 pounds of blueberries oh. um, so <laughs> sorry I forgot to mute myself oh yeah. I would love to have 75 pounds of blueberries <laughs> um, and we divvy them up in different ways and sometimes we we make pies or savory sauces we also um, supplied one of our friends who makes wine so he's gonna try and make some blueberry wine that we will share um, so yeah, it, I, I probably will mention blueberries and blackberries in this webinar as far as sharing some of the recipes because those are the things that when I travel somewhere else, I keep an eye out for. Um, I have family in southern Illinois, so when we go there in the summertime, I keep an eye out for, ooh, what's, what's fresh? Is it green beans? Is it apricots? And, um, and keep an eye out for those other things. So while we end up talking a lot about local um, North Dakota fruits and berries. Whenever you travel, go out and about and see what might be around these new geographies. Um, so yeah, we were we left off. Um, I was introducing you to some of my favorite species, and um, I just wanted to reiterate that I'm focusing on like fruits and trees this um, for this session because it's a really good place to start. One because Fruits are super nutritious, especially wild ones, and they aren't available in the stores. And if you do find them in stores, they're incredibly expensive. Um, but also from a practical standpoint, it's a good way to learn plant identification because you have the tree to look at, you have the leaves, you have the stems, you have the blossoms early enough, and then you have the fruit. And inside the fruit, you have the seeds. And so all of those are points of identification that can help you know and learn what it is that you want to forage. So I'm just giving a little bit of review of some of the things that we talk about when we talk about um, identifying edible species. And one is the leaf shape. You can see that the leaf shape varies. There's ovate or elliptical, chordate. The shape is um, one of the most distinctive characteristics that you can see even from far away for a plant. Um, leaf arrangement, whether the leaves are gathered at the bottom of a plant uh, whether the leaves on a tree are opposite from each other or whirled around on a stem or if they alternate. Um, there's also the leaf margin, so the, the edge of the leaf. Um, the source I got this from called it entire. I call it simple because there's really not anything. It's smooth. Um, there's toothed or also called serrate, like a serrated knife. Um, double toothed rounded and then lobed where it has those lobes like a maple or an oak leaf. Uh, 
um, different kinds of fruits. Um, there's berries that are an aggregate of seeds that surround the, the center of the fruit. Berries have a collection of seeds on the inside. Droops are like a plum or an apricot where there's just a pit inside. And then there's the palme, um, which is like the apples where it's a large fleshy piece with sets of seeds in the core. I included these seeds on there. If you're super interested um, in learning about trees, this can be helpful. The only edibles on here would be acorns, which are edible, or um, samaras aren't edible, but they're from the maple tree and box elder trees, which you get syrup from. And then twig characteristics. And I shared a link on my first one about a, a source that's really great for learning about twigs. So. This is your orientation, so you know what I'm talking about when I share these next species. So, wild grapes, um, they can be found throughout North America, and they thrive in good sun and soil moisture. You can find them along riverbanks, open woodlands, and roadsides. The leaves are alternate, um, often with opposite tendrils. So what's that mean? This tendril right here that goes completely opposite from that leaf and this one here you see that so the tendril will help the vine climb while the leaf collects the sunlight for the plant um, the leaves are very broad and coarsely serrate the small seeded fruits grow in clusters we tend to know what grapes look like because we get them in the supermarket but wild grape grapes are really pretty small um, a lot smaller that you than you would think but they're in the same shape, they grow in the cluster. And when foraging for grapes, I always cut or break right there and take the whole cluster. And then whenever I get them home, then I take them off the cluster because I'm not gonna waste my time picking each one off um, whenever I'm out in the field. And one reason for this is because they're very, very juicy when they're ripe. And the moment that you break them off the stem, they're gonna start leaking and juicing. And that's good stuff, you want that captured. Um, the fruits are usually mature late August, sometimes early September. Here's a photograph of one that I collected from this um, summer and the previous summer. I was disappointed this summer there wasn't as many fruits, but that's okay. Um, so you can really see the characteristics of the tendrils there and the vining. One thing I want to note is that the grapevines often grow up in trees. I mean, they're, they're climbing, they're competing for that sunlight. And so, depending on how big it is, you might not really even see it. You'll say, oh, that's a funny looking tree. Oh, wait, that's a choke cherry tree with grapevine climbing through it. Um, so be on the lookout there. The next one is American plum or wild plum. And they grow all over in this area. It seems like it's one of the most common edible plants to find. Um, they have these round droops or plums with a really large pit. And so um, they're kind of difficult to work with unless you juice them um, or pit them yourself, but there's such a large pit and the skin can be thick. And if you've ever tasted a wild plum, um, they're kind of sour. They're really sour once they're ripe, before they're ripe. Once they're ripe, they get sweet and stuff, but um, they really benefit from cooking and adding that, that sugar to it. The fruits are mature late August and early September. It's a large shrub or a small tree with a really broad crown. Um, so up on top, it's gonna be a lot bigger than it is on the bottom. Um, it's often growing in thickets and you find one, there's gonna be a lot more around. Um, my little note on that is sometimes when you're picking, you can get stuck in the thicket and that can be tricky because um, the branches are scaly and they have these kind of pseudo thorns. They're not really thorns, but they're prickles. Um, so getting in there, uh, picking plums, if you get into a thicket, it can be kind of painful. But the twigs are dark gray and they often break easily. And uh, the petals of the flowers, they have small white flowers with five petals. The clusters of blossoms bloom in the late spring. And there's the alternate leaves with an oval to lancelet shape with a toothed or serrate margin and the underside is noticeably paler. 
Here's a photograph here. I love it. It looks like Christmas ornaments hanging on a deciduous tree in the middle of summer. It's just so pretty. Um, but you can see the size of these fruits. They're actually pretty big and juicy, but the pit is significantly large in there. You can see these um, little pseudo thorns on there poking out. And you can even see the scales kind of on the, these branches here. Not all plums are going to be that red. Some of them, especially the Canadian varieties, are going to be kind of a, a lighter color. These ones that are real pale are not ripe yet. These ones are, and then these ones are um, just kind of pale colored. And I mentioned about the underside of the leaves being lighter colored. You can see this right along here on this leaf on the side of the picture here. Um, our next species is rose hips or rosa species. Um, they're one of my favorites. I don't collect too many of them because they are difficult to work with, but I'll share what I know about them. They're shrubs usually forming in thickets. Um, this is the wild rose picture here, um, often found in prairies, open woodlands, and dry slopes. And you can use rose hips from rose bushes that you might grow in your yard too. Um, the flowers blossom from May to July and are usually a pale pink to a deep rose. The fruits are deep pink or even orange to a bright red. They are best after frost and why that is is because the fruits have a lot of starches in them and after they get cold at the frost they turn to sugar and so it's sweeter and produces, if you cook with them you get less um, cloudiness in your jam or jelly or syrup. Um, and the kind of pain about the rose hip fruit is that it contains 15 to 35 thin hairy seeds that are right in the center of this fruit here. And the best way I can describe it is it reminds me if you've ever eaten a whole artichoke and gotten into the inside where there's those little pricklies, it's kind of like that. Um, so they do need some some preparation to make them edible. You can either cut them in half and scoop the seeds out, or you can cook them with the seeds and then strain it. Um, so if you do a juice with it, you can strain it out. These leaves are different than other ones we've talked about. They're actually on um, stems. The stems are alternate. Oakley, I need you to be quiet, please. Okay. Um, but the stems contain a compound arrangement of leaves. And so you see how they're all together on that one stem. Um, the leaves are actually also edible and can be used for teas. And I've seen recipes for um, candying the rose petals. And I haven't done that yet, so I can't speak to what that might be like. Um, the twigs are reddish brown to gray, and they have prickly thorns. And so here's a photograph here of the rose hips. Um, you can see how bright red this is, and it is after a frost. Most of the leaves have gone by, and this is when I collected them this year. When you're collecting in this stage, you might want to look out for some that are dried up um, and just leave those behind for the birds. Um, go, for the, go for the juicy ones. Yeah, You can see that the reddish-brown color of the twigs, the new growth is red, and then the rest of it's kind of this reddish-gray um, and you can see the thorns, the prickly thorns there. So my kids hated it when I made them go out rose hip picking with me because the thorns are right at their face level and they were getting scratched. And so they uh, they went and sat in the car while I while I foraged, but that's okay. They enjoy what, what comes out from it. Um, the next species is silver buffalo berry or Shepherdia argentia. Um, so silver, silver buffalo berry is a tall, thorny shrub. It grows in thickets, often in dry or alkaline soil, soils. Um, I often see it um, from the roadside, so kind of um, not really in ditches, but in areas that it's um, pretty dry and flat. Um, the fruits are elongated with a small pit, and they grow in clusters right near the stems. Whoop. I can show you that picture, I suppose. Right near the stem is where the, the fruit clusters up. The leaves are opposite, simple, 
an oblong and elliptical. They're silvery gray with scales or really fine hairs. Um, the flowers are small and yellow, and they too, because the fruits come from the flower, are right up against the stem. And they bloom late April to early May. And here's what a buffalo berry plant looks like. You can see the shape of the leaves, how long and elliptical they are, um, how that you can almost see the the texture to them. It's a little different. Um, they almost the shape of it reminds me of the rosemary plant, but it's not quite that thin. And um, the fruits in here, they have a small pit. And whenever picking them, they, there are kind of prickly thorns on the bush, but because the fruits are so close to the stem, you often end up with pieces of, of bark in there. So whenever you clean them, you have to be really careful to, to get all that out. Um, so those are some of my favorite species, and if you go back, you can see the rest of them on the first video, too. Um, step three of successful foraging is to watch and wait. Um, we're doing this in the middle or the beginning of winter. I'm hoping that those of you who are interested in foraging will get a book or two, start looking at your books, maybe um, go out and about and look at trees that you think might be producing fruit. and learn to identify them and then come spring you'll have the leaves and the blossoms to go and to go from and then watch and wait until your season comes about but there's so many things to forage throughout and I like I said there's only a little bit that I was able to talk about um, in the spring you can look for wild asparagus dandelion um, my oldest son he's seven he went to go collect dandelions but he went to the neighbor's house and asked him first, he says, do you spray your dandelions? I want to pick them. One neighbor did spray and the other neighbor didn't. Um, the neighbor that didn't spray had a lot more dandelions and he went and picked all the dandelions that were just fresh, young and um, green leaves and yellow blossoms. And we made dandelion salad and then um, fried the dandelion blossoms. Lamb's quarter is a plant that tastes a lot like spinach. It's often found in gardens. Um, common weed, so to speak. Um, stinging nettles you can eat are very edible and nutritious. I put rhubarb on there because it can be found in all sorts of places that people aren't actually utilizing it. So those are your spring ones. Early summer you can go collecting June berries, naking cherries, sour cherries, wild turnips, um, or what Dakota people call teepsina. Um, purslane is a low-growing plant that is often found in gardens. In late summer, there's choke cherries, black currants, field mint, crab apples, wild plums, wild hops, hazelnuts, raspberries, high bush cranberries. And then in early autumn, there's apples, acorns, elderberries, rose hips, and buffalo berries. And that's just a small sampling. So you really could spend a whole lot of time throughout your season harvesting things um, and, and learn a lot along the way. So whenever you go out to harvest, I mentioned this before, whenever you're exploring, but when harvesting, it's important to check the rules. If you're in a public um, land spot, a wildlife area, a state park, check the rules and see if, they're, if they allow foraging or gathering. Um, doesn't hurt to ask. They might even tell you where a good place to go is. Um, ask permission, especially if you're on private land. Um, Take only what you'll use. It's real easy when you're out there to get excited and say, oh, look at all this goodness. I want, I want as much as I can, but there's other species out there who are gonna benefit from the, the plants as well. And because the seeds are in fruits, that's also how a lot of trees reproduce. So um, just take what you need. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, be aware of wild animals that might be out there, um, other people, cars, because it's really easy just to like uh, get immersed in foraging, but you gotta be aware. Be respectful of others, absolutely. Um, don't litter. If you see litter, pick it up, please. Otherwise I will next time I go out. Um, and then consider possible sources of contamination, um, dust or overspray or dumping, and 
like uh, if you were going to collect rose bush or rose hips from your grandmother's rose bush, you might want to ask or what she's used to um, to treat her roses. She might have put stuff on there that you don't want to eat. Um, some tips for harvesting: always double check your identifications. Um, and even though I've been collecting food and studying plants for years now, I still do. I wait. Is that a is that a high bush cranberry? And I have my iPhone with me, and I just look it up and say, yes, that's it. Um, when foraging with children, help them learn to identify too, because the way kids children learn, they're in tune to picking up all those patterns and the colors and the textures of the plants, and they can be really, really good at it. Just um, show them some of the key key pieces, and next thing you know, but I teach mine too. Don't eat it unless you're absolutely sure you know what it is. I tell them to check with me first. Um, wear proper clothing. Long sleeves are important because you're kind of reaching in on the plant, and um, some of them have thorns, so you can get scratched up pretty bad. Um, but also, too, there's bugs and things that, that live in those trees, so long sleeves help you get keep from taking critters along with you. Um, pants are good, kind of the same reasons. You don't need to get your legs all scratched up. Wear shoes. Don't wear flip-flops. Wear good shoes that you can really maneuver in. Um, a lot of times in the summertime, it's going to be warm, so wear a hat and sunglasses because you don't want to get out there and say, oh, it's too hot. My head's getting sunburned. I'm, I want to keep picking, but it's too hot. Um, and wear sunscreen if you need to. Take water along. That way you stay hydrated. And don't forget buckets or containers to collect the food that you want. Um, during the summer months, we keep a bag of just generic food bags in our trunk. And then that way, if we find something, we have somewhere to store the, the fruits. Keep it fun. Um, keep in mind it's a process of learning and it can take years to, to learn all that you want to learn and honor your harvest. And so that's what I'll be talking about next is how to handle your harvest and how to um, make the most of it. So whenever you pick your berries, your fruit or anything, even if it's leafy things like nettles, you want to keep it cool. If you have a cooler to put it in um, or pick early in the morning or later in the day because that puts a lot less stress on the on the food. Um, when it, once you get it home and you've kept it cool, you want to rinse well. And I use my double sink and put a whole bunch in, of water in there and then put the fruits in and that lets the dust and any bugs get off and then, then rinse it well and pick it over. See if there's any things in there that you don't want. Um, my husband just picks whatever. He picks some yucky looking berries and I toss them out. Um, but then that's the way it goes. Um, so you want to sort them and then you want to dry them. So I, I lay mine all out um, in a deep bowl or on a flat sheet, um, cookie sheet, and then put a towel underneath there and let it dry. And you want to dry it before you store it. So a lot of the, the wild fruits you can store in the refrigerator for a day or two um, without much trouble after you've cleaned them. There's a few that you need to use right, right away. Um, so use your judgment, get to know the fruits. And other ones you can freeze and then use later. We still have plums in the freezer that need to be dealt with, so as well as June berries and black currants. And so they, they freeze well, and once they're in the freezer, they can you can use them for your holidays rather than having to take care of them whenever it's hot outside and you'd rather be outside playing. Um, and then take time to prepare them. So I'm going to share some recipes and I hope I have time to get through all I want to share. I, um, we'll see how I do here. So you can make juice. You can make a Russian drink called a kompot, syrup, cordial, which is also a drink, um, different kinds of jellies, flavored vinegars, uh, use flavored vinegars to make a drink called a shrub, and then there's spreads and sauces. And this is really just scratching the surface. Um, I provide information on these because this is what I know pretty well. There are a lot of other things you can do. You can ferment your fruits to make wine and drinks. You can make flavored liquors. You can make um, 
dried fruits or fruit leathers and the possibilities are endless. People have been using foods in different cultures in different times all throughout human history. So um, here's some good resources for recipes. Um, Nature's Garden was in the previous session that I had mentioned as a book to use for plant identification, but they also use information for preparing. Um, Native Harvest has a selection of American Indian wild food recipes, and that's much different than anything that I'll be showing you, but that, that would have recipes for wojapi or a fruit pudding, um, different dried fruits, as well as things like cattail soup, which I haven't made yet. Um, if you want to learn about preserving and canning, um, some really good books to do that with are the um, Ball Complete Book of Home Preserving. They don't really have wild fruit recipes in there, but it provides a good basics. Um, canning for New Generation, she has a lot of interesting variety of things. Um, she shows you how to make jellies without pectin, as does uh, Linda Ziedrich in Jams, Jellies, and Sweet Preserves. The reason I think that's important for the wild fruits is a lot of wild fruits, um, You when you pick them, they aren't always you're not just picking the ripest ones, you're picking a mixture. And so some of them have natural pectin themselves. Also too, you've gone to all this effort to pick these beautiful wild fruits. Why would you go and put pectin, store-bought pectin in it? Um, I don't know, I struggle with that myself because I don't like failure, but you, you kind of want to keep it pure too. So those are good sources. Um, and then there's a nice publication put together from NDSU, Jams and Jellies um, and Wild Fruits. And this is available online at um, ndsu.edu publications. Um, she shows you a little bit about how to test for pectin and some general directions. But she has recipes for current, current jelly, buffalo berry and crab apple. Um, choke cherry jelly, gooseberry jam, elderberry, and um, good variety, and some high bush cranberry, rose hip, wild plum. So that's a really that's a free resource that you can at least start to get familiar with. Okay, so the first one uh, recipe I want to introduce you to is juice. Um, you can use a steam juicer. These are fabulous little contraptions that uh, heat the water, heat water in a lower basin that evaporates up and then drips the juice out of the fruit. I don't have one. I want one. I want a good one for Christmas. Maybe I'll get it. Maybe I won't. Maybe that's why I'm still storing plums in the freezer because I'm waiting for my steam juicer. Um, but if you don't have a steam juicer, you can make juice in a saucepan. You combine one pound of fruit with a half a cup of water and cook it over low heat and gradually bring it to a simmer. Stir it often and you press the fruit with the back of your spoon until it starts to, to bleed its juices out. And then you can strain it through a cheesecloth or a jelly bag. Um, if you want to, you can preserve it in a water bath canner, freeze in containers, or use within five days. And the juices themselves, um, you can make juice for drinking from grapes, apples, cranberries, and cherries um, because they're mild and you can add sugar to taste. You can enjoy these fresh or preserve it in a water bath canner. Um, I say cranberries because after Thanksgiving, cranberries go on sale really cheap in the store and then go buy them and make your own cranberry juice. That's what I do. Um, but stronger fruits like choke cherries, blackberries, and currants are too strong to drink as a juice without diluting. Um, they can cause stomach cramping in that if you if you try to just drink the straight stuff. Um, but these juices can be used as a basis for other recipes and or it can be prepared in a canner for later use. So we have a bunch of choke cherry concentrate that we prepared, it's canned, we'll then use it to make jelly later. Um, so here's a basic formula for jelly. Um, this is a formula for high pectin fruits such as tart apples, crab apples, cranberries, currants, plums, and buffalo berries. If you're interested in jelly making, get some resources and learn about it. There's That would be a whole different webinar in itself. Um, I can't provide you all, but 
that you need to know before you dive into jelly making. But for a high pectin fruit, you can use three cups of juice, three cups of sugar, one tablespoon of lemon juice, and um, that will prepare five half pints of jelly. You combine the juices and the sugar and bring to a boil over medium heat, and stirring it gently. Raise the heat to medium high and boil until it sheets off a spoon. If you don't know what I mean by sheets, it's time you learned about jelly making. Because um, I can't explain it, it's, it's an art. Um, for medium pectin fruits such as choke cherries, blueberries, juneberries, and cherries, you can mix your juice with um, an equal amount of apple juice or crab apple, or find a recipe that uses commercial pectin. So when making jellies, find a tested recipe and follow it carefully. But, especially with these wild fruits, always be prepared to have syrup instead. Um, my Juneberry syrup was supposed to be jelly, but it's syrup and that is okay because it still tastes good. Um, if you want to make straight syrup, um, I have two recipes for you, two methods. A thicker syrup can be used as a topping for pancakes and such, but a thin syrup can be used with carbonated water to make flavored drinks. You can sweeten your tea with it. You can serve it for snow cones or turn it into a sorbet, which is a frozen, um, a frozen food, kind of like ice cream, but just with fruit juice. Um, the simple method for making syrup is good for fruits that would otherwise require seeding or pitting. So rose hips, cherries, choke cherries, those kind of things. Um, so you prepare your juice, like I just mentioned, and then you take one cup of juice and one and a quarter cup of sugar or two thirds cup of honey and bring that to a boil up to, and then bring it to 235 degrees. What that does is it makes it um, a, the consistency of syrup. And there's actually a test called a thread test in which you take a glass of cold water and take a sample of your syrup and let it drip in there. And if it goes as a thread, you've achieved a true syrup. Um, and one cup of juice with one and a quarter cup of sugar will give you 12 ounces of syrup. The other method is um, a fermented syrup method. And I learned this from um, Linda Zedrick's Jams and Jellies book, but I find it amazing. I do it with blackberries that I get in Oregon as well as blueberries. Um, and it's just really good for very ripe berries. Um, and you start with the fresh berry, not the juice. It takes a little longer, but you get a tangy flavor and it's good with pancakes and ice cream, but it's also really good as a as a beverage with um, carbonated water mixed. So you start with a pound of fruit and whirl that in the blender um, and pour that puree into a quart jar. And then you let it sit at room temperature with a cap on it for three to six days. So if you end up with a pound of fruit and can't deal with it right then, I find this is a really great way to, to do something with it. You kind of stir it every so often throughout the day until little bubbles rise and then you drain the liquid through a damp jelly bag and you'll end up with one and a half cups of fermented juice. You can put that in the refrigerator, wait till the next day. And then you take um, the equal amount. If it was one and a half cups of juice, you're gonna need one and a half cups of water. And then three cups of sugar and combine and heat Oh, I'm sorry, you're gonna need one and a half cups of water for the juice, but you're combining one and a half cups of water with three cups of sugar and rise the temperature up to 235. And then you add in the juices, um, your one and a half cups of juice and a little bit of lemon juice, stir that in and let it simmer. And you have three half pints of a perfectly unique syrup. Um, Another thing you can do with the juice concentrate is a cordial. This is often made with black currants, but you could also use blackberries, elderberries, cherries, or choke cherries. And this would make a nice sophisticated drink for, um, for maybe a holiday get together. So you would um, mix the cordial with two parts of water or club soda for a drink or serve it over ice cream. You can also um, make it with honey instead and drink a tablespoon of the honey version to soothe a sore throat. Um, two cups of juice concentrate, 
plus one and a half cups of sugar or honey, plus three tablespoons of lemon juice. Combine the juice, sugar, and lemon juice, and heat the mixture to a boil for one minute, and you have two cups of cordial. Um, while we're on drinks, there here is a kind of drink that, the well, first time I had it, it reminded me of a weak Kool-Aid, but way better than Kool-Aid ever was. Um, it's called a kompot and it's from um, Eastern European tradition and it's very refreshing. It's a good way to make a little fruit go a long way and so if you gather just a small amount of fruit and you want to enjoy it with your whole family this is a really great way to do it. And it's excellent when chilled and served on a summer day. Um, you can use plums, strawberries, apples, crab apples, pears, or cherries but you can use really any variety of other fruits or mix together. Um, you take one pound of fruit, one cup of sugar, and three quarts of water. Combine that and just slowly bring it to a simmer. And um, I usually let it come up to heat over the course of an hour and then let it simmer for about a half an hour. Add a little lemon, lemon juice if you want. That'll help keep the color and give it a little tang. And then strain it and chill it before serving. It's almost as easy as Kool-Aid ever was. Um, so I'll give you a different um, kind of recipe here for flavored vinegars. Um, these can be used to make a salad dressing, so um, raspberry vinaigrette or blueberry vinaigrette, those kind of things you can um, use out of a vinegar. The marinade is also really great for wild game, and so um, I have a blackberry vinegar that we've used to marinade Canada goose in. And that's turned out really well. I'm not a fan of goose, but the the blackberry marinade kind of brought it around for me. Or you can make an old time drink called a shrub. Shrubs were um, popular long before carbonated be beverages were. Um, you can use raspberries, buffalo berries, rose hips, blackberries, choke cherries, and currants. You take one pound of fruit and two cups of vinegar. Um, you could use red wine vinegar, white wine vinegar, or apple cider vinegar, and use your judgment um, pairing it with the different kinds of fruits. Blackberries, I use red wine vinegar. Rose hips, I use white wine. Um, raspberries, I would probably use red wine. And um, currants, I might use apple cider vinegar. And you put your fruit in a jar and cover it with vinegar. Put a lid on it and let it sit room temperature for three to four weeks. Um, it's a nice way to be able to forget about fruit for a little bit and come back to it and it's even better. You strain it, strain it and funnel it into a sterilized bottle and store in a cool, cool place for four to six months. You can um, use it right away, that's fine, but it'll last up to four to six months. Um, how to turn it, turn the flavored vinegar into a shrub? You combine the vinegar and the sugar you, you would use three cups of flavored vinegar to three quarter cups of sugar and bring it to a boil over medium heat and boil for 10 minutes. And then you have the shrub syrup and then you mix one part syrup to three parts water and ice. Um, I do this with the blackberry kind and it's just kind of like my afternoon treat rather than I used to be addicted to Pepsi. I hate to say that, especially on a <laughs> recorded thing. Um, but so blackberry shrub I have in the afternoons instead and it's it's sweet and tart and um, enjoyable and it's good for your immune system too so it's a it's a win um, here I cannot go into all the varieties of spreads that you could make um, you could make jams or preserves or butters with a lot of the fruits and I also put pickles in there um, because you could make pickled fruits. There really are so many options and um, I encourage you to learn about this and explore yourself. Um, I'll provide my email at the end of the end of the session here and you're welcome to email me and ask for advice or ideas and and that but so I'll just provide a little bit of guideline here. Uh, there really are so many options when it comes to this. Um, as you learn, I would suggest trying to create other flavors and make something really unique because you already have um, 
something special with the, the hand harvested fruit. But if you mix apple and basil to make a, a spread or a jelly or a jam, that can be amazing. Um, raspberry jalapeno, plum with star anise or ginger, rose hip and honey. Um, all of those are good flavor combinations. And whenever you start to, to learn these different things to do with the fruits, I encourage you to think out of the box. So um, because a lot of the recipes I've showed you already were fruit, sugar, fruit and sugar, um, I'm providing you a little bit of, uh, I guess, a springboard to think of other ways to, to use them because there are a lot of savory applications for wild fruit. Um, wild plums and crab apples cooked into a mild butter, so like apple butter, make a really good base for base sauce for roast pork. Um, so rather than a barbecue sauce, you have fruit-based sauce, and you can add garlic and pepper and things to that. Um, apple ginger preserves are amazing with bacon. It's my new favorite sandwich, apple ginger preserves with bacon, um, which I might have for lunch today. Choke cherry jam. If you mix it with ground mustard, black pepper, onion, red wine vinegar, and molasses, you get a barbecue sauce. And I am so excited about this because I have learned that my body doesn't like tomatoes so much. Ugh, it's awful. Um, so what am I supposed to do about barbecue sauce? Well, I can have choke tray barbecue sauce. I can also make a rose hip butter. So like an apple butter, but with rose hips. And it's delicious with turkey. And it's a suitable and sophisticated substitute for ketchup. Um, and you, I mentioned the fruit pickles because that's essentially spiced, um, spiced fruit. It's, it's preserved in vinegar. You can make spiced crab apples, cherries, or plums, um, and really many other things too. Um, and that pairs very well with wild game. So that's what we'll be having tomorrow for Thanksgiving is spiced blueberries with basil with our deer, their venison. Um, what I encourage you to do is as you learn, it's really important to remember for next year. Um, going out and about and learning these different species and then you say, oh wait, what? where was that wild plum thicket at? Um, because a year can can go by pretty fast, but it can also shift our memory. Um, so I would suggest getting a write in the rain all weather journal um, and why these are kind of suited to this kind of task is that they're waterproof. So you can keep one in your car or in your backpack or wherever. And if it gets a little bit wet, it's going to be fine. And you'll be able to keep your your notes for foraging in there. Um, you can keep the journal however you want. It can be very scientific where you write down the day and the time and the weather and the temperature and where you found and you could GPS your coordinates or whatever. Or you could have something that's a little bit more, um, I guess, artsy and intuitive because we have different kinds of people and different kinds of brains. Um, if you're one of the artsy ones that say, oh, don't make me keep records, please, I don't want to keep records, I would suggest um, checking out the book, A uh, Trail Through Leaves, A Journal of Paths, A Journal as a Path to Place by Hannah Hitchman. And um, she provides you some good ways to be able to document um, the, the world around you in a way that is comfortable with you. And if this was a class where you guys were graded, I would say extra points to the person who can identify this little fruit that's up here on the picture. Um, so my suggestions for remembering for next year are you can write it down or visit the spot often. Go there often enough that you're not going to forget it. Um, make friends with the specimen that you're looking at, the tree, the plant, the fruit, whatever. Go often and see how it's doing and keep checking up on it or do both. Um, here is my foraging landscape. I shared it with you at the beginning of this of the session one. Um, in my mind, I know where these places are. And um, as we find new places, we put them on here. Um, my, I kind of put my house in the middle and then say, OK, well, here's, here's the apples that are next door. And then from there, so it's not to scale. 
um, I feel like it's a treasure map that no one else is really going to be able to understand this and say, oh, I know where she goes to get wild asparagus, um, but it's a record for me so I can keep an idea of where things are, but also when they come around, um, because up here there's things that are ripe in August and then again in October, and that helps me kind of remember and um, yeah, as you travel too, it might be a good spot if you travel across the state or to other states. Uh, keep a journal of things that, ooh, those might be ripe. And if you travel at the right time, you can come back with a whole stash of goodies. So my message for you, hopefully what you took away from this, is that foraging can be a resourceful, adventurous, delicious, healthy, and educational way to interact with your world. Um, because it is for me. I hope it can be for you too. Here are my list of resources that I use to help put this together. Um, I would recommend any of these books to help you get started. Um, and I said there is my email. It's rachel.brazil at ymail.com. Um, if you want to share your journey, the things you're learning, uh, maybe questions, by all means, send me an email and um, and connect. You could find me on Facebook too, and I'm happy to, to share a little bit more. So thank you to Farms and to Sue for letting me share what I know about foraging for the Wednesday webinar. And I hope everyone has a good Thanksgiving. Let me pull back here and see if there's any questions. Sue, do you have any questions? I do not have any questions. That was like totally awesome. It makes me want to run out and walk up and down the riverbank. Do you I, have I, any? I do have a question though, or maybe it's more of a comment, but you know, I talk to people about there used to be so much wild fruit along the river and now there's yeah. nothing. Um, they flooded a lot of it out when they flooded the dam. Yeah. Um, so while I found one choke cherry tree along the river close to where I live, after the flood the second time, like when we got flooded out of our house, you think I could find that stupid tree? <laughs> it's disappeared. It may have died in the flood. So. And and yeah, tr trees have a hard time with floods. They they do. I mean, it damages their root system, and they can. And so, yeah, I guess that's. Kind of with my, one thing I wanted to mention with my map, it makes me think about is that if the areas close to me aren't producing, I know that we had a windstorm and there was not very many choke cherries because all the blossoms got thrown off, I know where I can go a little bit further. Um, so hopefully you can find things close to home, but if you can't, then you, you know, go so further to find point. the good. Yeah. That's one thing that makes them so special and scarce is because there is a, they are a limited resource. Well, excellent, excellent, excellent. I appreciate your time so much. And um, we will see you at our Farm Beginnings class in a couple weeks. Yes, I'm looking forward to that too. Great. That will be so awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. And everybody who joined us today, whether you're here live or whether you're here with the recording, and um, have a great Thanksgiving, everyone.